Good morning, everyone. I am Corey Boone, Special Deputy here at the Maryland Insurance Administration. And I would like to welcome everyone to our third work group meeting for Senate Bill 460. In today's meeting, we will complete the uh, presentation of the mental health navigational resources that already exist within the state, discuss programs similar to the chat model that exists in other states, and discuss the definition of consumer assistance services and Senate, Senate Bill 460 in order to address the scope of services proposed for chat. I will announce the members of the Maryland Insurance Administration. We have Commissioner Kathleen Barang, Associate Commissioner of Life and Health, David Cooney, Associate Commissioner of Consumer Education Advocacy Unit, Joy Hatchett, Principal Counsel, uh, Van Dorsey, and Communications Director, Craig I. So for the rest of the attendees, please introduce yourself and the organization you represent. And can we please give the honor to, I just saw Kathy. There you go. Welcome back, Kathy. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, and we start the introduction. Sure thing. Uh, it's Ann Seacott with Public Policy Partners representing the Maryland chapter of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Quentin. Good morning, everyone. Quentin Askew, uh, President and CEO of Two Long Maryland. Uh, Pat. You mute it. Good morning, Pat O'Connor, Deputy Director of the Health Education Advocacy Unit in the Office of the Attorney General. Neil. Good morning, everyone. Neil Karkanis here on behalf of the League of Life and Health Insurers. Ellen. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellen Weber. I'm with the Legal Action Center, and we convene the Maryland Parity Coalition. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly. Good morning, Kim Camarada, the Director of the Attorney General's Health Education Advocacy Unit. And our uh, esteemed uh, legislators, uh, Delegate Collison. Thank you, Corey. Um, Bonnie Collison representing District 19, Montgomery County and the House of Delegates. And Senator Augustine. Good morning, Senator Malcolm Augustine, District 47, Prince George's County. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to the presentation of existing resources by Joy Hatch. Thanks, Corey. Um, I'm Joy Hatchett, the Associate Commissioner of Consumer Education in the Advocacy Unit here at the Maryland Insurance Administration. And what I'm going to do is very briefly just bring to a close the discussion that Associate Commissioner Quay started in our last meeting. What Mary did was she gave an overview of the various resources that are available either through other agencies or other groups that um, help with mental health and substance use issues. And as Mary noted, there are a multitude of resources that are out there. In some counties, you have more resources than you have in others. And that we still, um, based on our research, there are still, from what we have determined, some gaps that exist there. That's purely based on our research. But also one of the things that we have found is that there's not probably the level of coordination that should exist between those resources. And more importantly, I don't think that there's enough consumers 
that know of all of the resources that are out there. And that's something that my unit here at the Insurance Administration, we endeavor to assist consumers know more about the resources that are available to assist them in all levels, uh, either being state resources or community resources. But I think once we, as we go along with this discussion, I think all of us can work together and collaborate to figure out how we can make sure that consumers are aware of the existing resources and then also once the group determines what of course this particular working group and the piece of legislation that the senator introduced we can do everything that we can to fill in the gaps as necessary but if anyone has any specific questions for me about what our resources specifically exist i'm happy to take those questions now or you can feel free to reach out to me after this meeting so that we can discuss more specifically uh, the resources that are available. And Delegate Cullison, I see that you, you've got your <laughs> hand raised. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joy, I appreciate um, your information. Can you just give me just a, a, a couple examples of what you um, identified as the gaps? Well, I know that the piece of legislation that the senator was really focused on was the uh, ability to do more, um, I guess, reaching out to consumers, making consumers aware of the resources, and then also basically helping them with the insurance piece, understanding what their rights and their obligations are under the terms of their policy and how to access that care. And then also um, when they come through our process here at the Insurance Administration, currently, well, I know that HEAU helps individuals to some degree I don't think that right now there's actually a mechanism to help them throughout the rest of that process. So that's something that we might want to, um, the group may, if they decide that that's something that should be done, we can talk about that as something that we can improve on. But I think the key here is making sure consumers actually know what is available. And I, that I think is an issue across the board. A lot of times consumers just don't know all the things that are available to them. And, and right. I just to put a, a, and I think joy has got it exactly right, but just to um, put a, a fine point on it is that I think what we observed is that there are, um, there are a lot of programs that exist to support people and connect them with mental health services. Um, there isn't necessarily a good central repository of that information or a, a program that helps guide people to those places and then walks with them as they try to access that care and get the care paid for either by you know a public um, you know program or through private health insurance and so i would say it's that probably what i refer to um, maybe not completely accurately but a navigator um, program that um, i you know what we've seen as as lacking great thank you thank you both very much that's very helpful and that's all i have unless there are any other questions corey any other questions? Seeing none. All right, thank you, Joy. Uh, next, we, we will hear uh, presentations on other state approaches um, by Van Dorsey. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, in trying to understand um, uh, the bill and uh, you know where we are with that, uh, we thought it would be helpful to to look at, and, and in fact, we did look at, you know, other state programs uh, throughout the country, and you know, the the folks at the MIA have looked at really virtually every state, 
Uh, I can tell you that uh, not many states have a program similar to what is in this bill. Uh, obviously, uh, I think what is probably the most um, similar uh, program is, uh, is the, that which is in New York, which is uh, my understanding is the, uh, is the, the basis, you know, the, the underlying basis for the bill. Uh, and, and, you know, it's interesting because you look at bill, uh, the, the bill uh, that created uh, the New York program, and it's only three paragraphs, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot packed in there. And um, it creates um, uh, what's called an independent substance use and mental health ombudsman program. And uh, that is a joint program of the Office of Addiction Services and the Office of Mental Health which are both under the auspices of the New York Department of Health. And uh, the ombudsman uh, is a specific director who is hired for the, the job of, you know, what Kathleen referred to as a navigator. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the services are to help um, New York residents with, um, you know, uh, actively enrolling in health uh, insurance, uh, understanding what benefits are covered, finding mental health providers uh, throughout the state, uh, assisting with uh, uh, obtaining uh, needed approvals, uh, what we would refer to as a prior approval, um, helping with appeals and denials. Uh, those are both in, uh, internal and external appeals. I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, the filing of complaints uh, with uh, insurance departments uh, or with, uh, with the insurance department uh, or with other entities. Uh, and um, significantly providing referrals uh, to the residents uh, uh, to, uh, to various programs that they have worked with, such as uh, the Legal Action Center, uh, that um, can help uh, assist uh, the residents of New York with uh, understanding uh, what they have and where they need to go in order to, to obtain the services that they want. Uh, you know, it's, uh, in looking at, uh, in comparing the bill, I think it's probably useful to compare that bill with our bill. And, and, and there are two significant differences uh, that I would mention. Uh, the one is uh, uh, they have set it up as a, as a uh, state program that is, you know, within the Department of Health. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's essentially as a state agency. Uh, you know, and that is a little bit different uh, than the way it's, uh, you know, in, in the bill here, the incubator entity, of course, is housed within uh, the, the university system. And so that's, that's a difference. Uh, the other significant difference is the scope of the services that are provided. Uh, and, you know, um, the, the, the main difference in that regard is uh, under the bill, it looks like uh, it is intended for uh, the um, uh, incubator entity or the programs to actually ad, uh, advocate and act as counsel to, um, to the um, consumers. Uh, in New York, they certainly will uh, help, uh, help with uh, providing assistance with regard to internal appeals and external appeals. And that goes as far as uh, preparing complaints uh, and, uh, and, and the, the necessary documents and understanding um, what they need to file for those appeals, but it, it does not appear to be uh, as, as to go as far as filing lawsuits on behalf of uh, the, the the resident or uh, you know appearing uh, at a hearing at, on behalf of you know as counsel for for the New York resident. So so that's a significant difference. And you know in comparing that to other states, uh, that uh, that is uh, seems to be um, consistently uh, the case. Uh, you know, for example, if you look at uh, Connecticut, who I know uh, advocated uh, for, for the bill, uh, they have uh, an office that is called the Office of Healthcare Advocate. Uh, and they perform many of the same duties uh, that, uh, that I mentioned uh, for New York. Uh, and again, uh, you know, they do not actually act as counsel for, um, uh, for, the, for the New York residents. Uh, you know, it might be help, helpful to hear that what their uh, mission is. The mission of the Office of Healthcare Advocate is to assist consumers with healthcare issues through the establishment of effective outreach programs and the development of communications uh, related to consumer rights and responsibilities as members of healthcare plans. Uh, OHA focuses on assisting consumers in making informed decisions when selecting a health plan, 
assisting consumers to resolve problems with their health insurance plans and tracking trends of issues, problems, which may require administrative or legislative intervention or ad advocacy with industry, uh, the public, or other stakeholders. And that's that's pretty consistent with what we've seen. There, there's a, uh, a new program uh, in Colorado uh, where they uh, just in this past July created um, a new behavioral health administration. Uh, and, and that's what's interesting about that is that it's, it's separate, it, well, it's not separate yet, but it's eventually gonna be separate from uh, the Colorado, what they, what uh, the, what we would refer to as the Department of Health, but it's, uh, it's its own agency. The Department of Health uh, in Colorado handles, you know, mostly like uh, the mental health facilities, whereas this uh, acts more as a, um, this uh, assistance cell center. And within uh, the Colorado office, there is, let me make sure I have the, the right title. There is the Behavioral Health Access to Care Ombudsman. There's that word again. And, and that person, again, uh, acts, you know, frankly, in many ways, uh, like uh, the HEAU unit uh, that, that is in Maryland, uh, to uh, provide assistance uh, to, uh, to the residents and um, uh, make referrals as appropriate, file complaints, including filing complaints with the Department of Labor, uh, but not actually going so far as to uh, be uh, you know, the representative. Uh, one, one final, I, and I don't want to take up too much time on this, one final state bill I think that's worth mentioning uh, is Ohio, where they have a, um, they've recently created what's called the Ohio Mental Health Insurance Assistance Office. Again, very similar services. Uh, there, what's interesting about that is actually uh, a, a division of the Department of Insurance uh, in that one. And that's, uh, that's unique in, um, in what I found among other, other, the other states. Usually it's sort of an, more of an independent office of uh, the Department of Health. But there, uh, it's um, part, of, part of the Department of um, Insurance. Uh, with regard to um, uh, self-funded plans, they specifically say that they don't have jurisdiction over that, but they can uh, assist with uh, you know, letters to the uh, Department of Labor. Uh, and they can also refer uh, people to the um, Ohio uh, Bar Association uh, for, for, to be able to find attorneys uh, to assist them should they wish to file a lawsuit. So that's, uh, that's, that's in a nutshell. I didn't want to take up too much of our time uh, about that. Um, if there, I'm happy to field any questions. Hey, uh, Van, just a quick mention, and I apologize, um, but I know that you and David have worked on uh, and, uh, and Joy's unit as well on a summary on a chart that addresses the state, uh, other, what other states have done. Um, and is that something that we'll, we will be able to uh, push out? So yeah, it's, I, I would say it's not ready for prime time right now. Um, it is uh, very much an internal document, uh, but we, um, we just because it, it, you know, it, it's got a lot of my no personal notes in it and things like that of that nature. But uh, I think that's something if, if people want, we, we could certainly push that out. Thank you, Van. Uh, Dalika Carlson. Uh, thank you, Corey. Um, I'm wondering now uh, if Pat or Kim can speak to HEAU's role currently, um, um, because I heard some, you know, things around advocacy, and um, you know, that's in your name. So, um, what are are there currently any? Is there any advocacy on the part of consumers that is sort of being envisioned here, or is that something we don't currently have the capacity to do? Um, so yeah, thank you, Delegate. We, yes, I mean, we advocate on behalf of consumers. So um, right. when it comes to health insurance plan denials, um, our office assists consumers with private insurance, and that includes both Maryland regulated plans, self-funded plans, um, sh short-term limited duration plans, church plans. Um, we don't assist consumers um, 
that strictly have Medicare um because we have ship offices that help with um appeal medicare appeals having said that if a consumer um has um has supplemental coverage with a private plan and we're talking about a coordination of benefits between medicare and a supplemental plan then we certainly assist those consumers um and we'll confer sometimes with ship if we need some special um, knowledge about the Medicare rules. As you can imagine, the Medicare rules are very complicated. Um, it's my understanding that the New York um, program, which we um, you know, frequently communicate with, um, they use the Medicare Rights Center um, to provide them sort of the expertise they need in the Medicare space. Um, and, and we also do not handle Medicaid appeals. We refer those over back over to the program unless it's a dual, a dual eligible. So there are some um, Marylanders that have both Medicaid and private insurance, and we will work with those. If, if, private, if there's a private insurance touch point, then we are assisting those consumers. And we do so, and we do it by advocating for the consumer, right? We're gathering information from the provider. Um, we're gathering information from the carrier. Um, we are sometimes just educating the consumer. They may, for example, think that their insurance didn't cover um, didn't cover their services when in fact they were fully covered by the plan. They were just put to the consumer's deductible. And sometimes we're just educating people about that. Um, or, you know, we frequently, unfortunately, see carriers deny coverage. Um, you know, there are there's routine denials of coverage. And we will um, assist the consumer by appealing that internally with the plan. Um, we're pretty su successful sort of in that space, but um, failing a change at the internal level, we will then um, write a letter on behalf of the consumer to the external reviewer, whether that's the MIA for, for uh, Maryland regulated plans, whether that's um, whomever the self-funded um, plan has set up as its external reviewer, um, you know, it varies on plan type. So then we will file that external appeal um, and um, we're fairly successful with that. Um, but if we are unsuccessful um, at the external appeal level, then, you know, what's left are um, judicial rights, but we cannot individually represent the consumer and file lawsuits on behalf of the consumer, which I believe is one of the services that um, was intended to be part of this bill. We don't provide those services. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ellen? Thanks so much, Corey. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to make, you know, one comment in, 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 you know, just in following up on, on, on Mr. Dorsey's um, explanation. Um, as I, as, as he mentioned, Legal Action Center is one of the partners in CHAMP. And um, and just to clarify, Champ does provide legal representation. They are representing those clients. Um, they they are representing them in their internal grievances, in their external appeals. Um, they can file lawsuits on their behalf. Um, I don't know the extent to which that happens, but they are they are the client's representatives. And I guess I just wanted to draw people's attention to the testimony that was presented by both CHAMP and the Connecticut Office of Healthcare Advocate, because what I think they do is I think they give a very clear idea of what the scope of services is. And they also, though, give a very clear view about two other points. One is just the dramatic need for these services for individuals with mental health and substance use disorders. And they clearly identify some of the differences that exist for those cases versus cases with regard to medical surgical. They tend to be much more complex. They much, tend to be much more difficult. The case records are much, much more extensive. And that requires individuals who understand those issues and can invest the time in order to work their way through it. And it also is a situation in which those are individuals that often require the hands-on support from the very beginning of the process through the end, that they are far less likely to do internal grievances. They are far more in need of those hands-on services. And I thought the one other point that the testimony that the Connecticut Office of Healthcare Advocate demonstrated is that there is a coordination effort that, that is often missing here. 
I don't think that, you know, none of these entities stand in opposition to one another. They, in fact, stand together to support one another, to assist in filling in the gaps. And that is the intention of SB 460. That was always the intention of it. And we're going to talk about the scope, the, the scope of activities. And I think the, the identification of the activities really reflects that. But in this situation with the Office of Healthcare Advocate, I think one of the really critical things to think about is to see how much assistance they provide to their State Department of Family Services. Because what the State Department of Family Services does with Office of Healthcare Advocate is they basically say, our state is being asked to come cover a lot of psychiatric care for kids who are within our, you know, that we work with and the, within, our, within our jurisdiction. And in fact, in many of these situations, it's private health plans that should be covering these bills. They do a lot of advocacy on behalf of those individual situations in order to get payment from the right source. So they save the state a lot of money. So I just want to bring to everybody's attention, there is this element of collaboration and coordination that we think is at the heart of this effort um, that we don't want to miss, miss, um, light, miss, you know, miss, miss, the, miss the importance of that, as well as how the Office of Healthcare Advocate demonstrates that that can be done. Um, so I wanted to, to highlight those. And again, the only, only other issue I want to say, there may be different ways of describing what these activities are. But at the bottom line, the activities are ones that are consistent with what the federal government said the Office of a Consumer Assistance Program or an Ombuds Program is. And it is those four activities. It is you know, it's assisting these clients, helping them navigate. It is representing them in matters, and it is gathering data and using that data to identify trends and problems and address that. So if you take a look at the Office of Healthcare Advocates report, they are talking about a lot of advocacy that they do with the legislature, as well as with state agencies, in order to fix the problems that are systemic problems. Again, that's a really critical piece in, in SB 460. So just wanted to, to, to kind of tie some of those pieces together. Yes, Ellen, Ellen I, I had a, a quick question for you. Um, so I, I, I hear what you're saying about the family services and, and you know, we're still looking into the scope of the um, sort of the setup of the uh, program within the Maryland Department of Education which does actually have that sort of central coordinator for family services embedded in schools that does link with you know, private insurance. So th there's sort of more work to be done on where they are in setting that up because that is an existing program. But specific to um, your organization's work in New York, where you take on the representation of individuals who are submitting claims you know, in courts or other tribunals, um, that is a, a role that you take on, I assume, as a spoke for a specific service. And is with respect to the human beings that are the lawyers that are doing the advo that advocacy work, they're employees of your organization. And are they fully funded by New York? Or is so, how does the funding work for? those services that you're doing as lawyers, where you go into court? Is that the New York dollars that are funding you going into court as an advocate for someone? Yes, so uh, the Legal Action Center is one of the specialty entities in CHAMP. We are funded directly through the CHAMP program. So that money goes from the state to Consumer Service Society and Consumer Service Society subgrants those those dollars to um, to the Legal Action Center to the Center for Medicare Advocacy, the uh, Center for Medicare Rights, as 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 Kim indicated, to do some of those specialty activities. There has never been a situation in which Legal Action Center has represented somebody in court. It is attorneys in the Legal Action Center that do that work. I supervise an attorney in New York who does the matters that are referred to us, the client matters. They are primarily parity enforcement matters because that's one of the key pieces in CHAMP being established. And again, the testimony from CHAMP indicates that a lot of these problems are grounded in parity violations. And so Legal Action Center has the expertise to develop those complaints when they are, in, when they're needed. 
Anyway, and, when, and I'm because this is really, I think, important as we think about functions and funding, I'm going to drill down just a little bit more. So, you know, that person who is the lawyer who is employed by the Legal Action Center, where, uh, it, so a couple questions. First, does that person, when you say complaints, are you talking about judicial complaints, that they develop the mental health complaint? Where are they submitting that complaint? Thus far, thus far, we have always developed these complaints for purposes of filing either an external appeal or with the failure of that external appeal, we very often take it, send it to the Department of Financial Services if it is a state regulated plan. And then in certain situations, we are developing complaints for the person to take to the Department of Labor if it is a person to take to the department. I'm sorry, the person to take to the Department of Labor. Well, what happens is so so here's the difference. It is Consumer Services Society that represents the client. They are the client's representation. The Legal Action Center is drafting the complaint on behalf of the person, but really the Consumer Service Society signs that, signs that document. And as I said, to my knowledge, they have never yet filed a complaint in court. That is not, that is not excluded from their work, but the focus has not yet been there. So the so that's helpful because you know vocabulary is important and we use the word complaint to mean a lot of different things. That can be you know, a, a literally filing a lawsuit before a court, or it can be filing an administrative um, action. So I'm going to finish up in just one second. They, they, but my next question is that every grant typically has a scope of services baked into the grant to say what you can specifically use the grant money for. And what I'm interested in is for this sub grant that's been given to the Legal Action Center. Does that subgrant specifically address um, representing using the state funds, the subgrant funds, to fund civil litigation in the courts? I, I do not know. I have not looked at that, and I don't know that it would be that specific. It, it, our our role is to provide education. It's to provide client assistance. Our expertise through our Parity Act enforcement, which again, as I said, we do that in all of the various either internal grievances for external reviews, as well as complaints that go to the insurance department. We cover with great specificity the parity component of that, as well as other legal rights that that individual has. And then our other responsibility is to evaluate the trends that we are seeing as a result of our work to provide guidance to the state on, on system-wide problems. And that, and again, I will say among us, and this is and among us, the difficulty in doing that is that the data that is collected by Consumer Services Society belongs to the state. It belongs to the Department of Health. And therefore, the only advocacy that can be done is by one sister agency advocating with another sister agency in order to address system-wide problems. That creates inherent difficulties if those state agencies are not resolving the problem. And that, that there, therein lies some of the reason so, that we have taken a slightly different approach with SB 460. So not, I don't want to cut you off because we are actually going to help get to this meeting to walk through these services. But I, I really just wanted to take a moment to drill down to be very specific about the litigation function because understanding and being really clear about what's happening in New York um, as a backdrop is just helpful when we get to those other discussions. And I know, Van, you had your hand up. And the, only, the, the only other thing I want to say is one has to understand that this was a, New York is a new, it's only three years, it's on its fourth year now. It had a limited budget 
And that budget dictates, obviously, what it can do and where it uses its resources. So to the extent that there have not, there hasn't been litigation filed over the past three years does not mean that's precluded. It just means that there are all sorts of considerations as to how you use those resources. Along those, li along those lines, uh, my understanding is that the New York budget is about a million five. Uh, and in addition to what we've talked about uh, recently, the, the bill uh, was expanded to cover uh, veteran services as well. So that million five covers more than, in some ways, more than the, what we do. And of course, New York is a bigger state. Uh, so that, so uh, the money uh, does get spread around a little bit more. I mean, my, my understanding is that uh, recently, uh, the ombudsman has hired an attorney uh, within her staff. And, no, no, yeah, uh, and um, and so she's she is helping with uh, drafting uh, some of the appeals uh, that 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 you mentioned. Uh, you know, it, my understanding from CSS from talking to to the folks there is that you know legal action there is not acting as an attorney as yet. So and I think that's consistent. Uh, you know, with regard to filing the filing of lawsuits, but um, and I think that really is consistent with what what you were saying. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Just to clarify, Van. I mean, obviously, the person who is the managing attorney for CSS, the managing person for CSS, Carla Lopez, is yeah. an attorney. There is enough. There, ha there have been several attorneys on her staff. The Legal Action Center. I'm obviously an attorney. My colleague in New York is an attorney as well. So we, so we are, we are all providing this legal expertise. There is, and and again, yes. So and to, and and so while one may not need to be a lawyer to file an administrative complaint, right? That does not mean we are not practicing attorneys who are doing these activities with a view as to how do you solve that that client's problems. And if the problem is solved through an administrative at the administrative process, that of course is. Is the is the preferred way of going about it? Do they have an HEAU type unit? I mean, is the AG in New York involved in this in any way? And is Light Legal Action Center the only external legal resource? No, I think it's really important to understand. You put your finger on a very important point, Commissioner Bahrain. The the New York Attorney General has a very active health department and a health bureau. And that health bureau was one of the entities that filed the earliest and most seminal complaints against carriers for violations of rights under state and federal law governing mental health services. But I'm not talking about their general big lawsuits. I'm talking about consumer. They help, yes. oh, they help consumers yeah. all the time. And one of the things, again, this is a very critical point. And I'm going to, unfortunately, people are tired of hearing it. The HEAU does not work on Mental Health Parity Act. We have worked because in part under the state's, under the state's insurance law, under their Consumer Protection Act, insurance is removed from the Consumer Protection Law. That is very different than in New York. Under New York, most of the Health Bureau's cases in this context are brought under their state's consumer protection laws. And they also have another specific mental health parity law that they use, as well as the federal law. But the Attorney General's office is very active in that. That's where, that's where all of this started. And so we, re we, we refer, and CSS will refer folks to the, the Health Bureau of the Attorney General's office for these very specific matters. We are in co communication with them frequently. So there are multiple avenues, but it's this consumer assistance program that is different. And the reason it's different is because individuals don't know how to get to the AG's office. They don't know, they need the representation and the assistance to get to that. And there may be problems that can be resolved on the front end. And that's why you have a consumer assistance program, again, under this the same for the federal program that was developed under the ACA. It fits that really critical niche. It is that bridge. It is what knits it all together. And again, the resources aren't plentiful enough to cover all the problems. This would be another resource to help. If we don't, if we don't get to these questions, Senator Augustine is going to come through that screen at me. So, and I'm sorry, uh, Corey, because my 
curiosity for some additional details took you off your timeline. So um, I'm gonna, I think you probably want Kim to ask her question or make her comments, and then we should probably dive into Com the, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Barain, I'm not coming through the screen. I'm appreciating okay. the conversation. I think it's wonderful. Okay, really thank do. you. Thank you. Okay, Kim. Um, Commissioner, I actually wanna, the question you asked about, do they have a, a so New York has the Community Health Advocate Program, which was set up as the CAP program. Ellen has referred to the ACA's Consumer Assistance Program and the model of that program. Our, our um, the HEAU was deemed Maryland State CAP. In fact, um, Senator, you may recall, we were concerned when this bill first came about um, that we were designated as the ACA's CAP program. We've been fighting for years to get additional federal funding for our program. Yep, um, and we accommodated and, that and in the bill. Absolutely, and very yeah. grateful for that. And so I just wanna make sure that, and I know this work group is discussing sort of, sort of based on where the bill came out of the Senate and, and it came out with, you know, the HEAU continuing to perform that function that, we've, that we have long performed. Um, and so, and like New York, they have the community health advocate program and they are the consumer assistance program, sort of the global one, right? Not just for mental health and substance use disorder. Um, and so, you know, and what they've had with the CHAMP program and, and, and Ellen, you know, our, our unit, the health education advocacy units would certainly welcome um, the opportunity to be able to work with a program or have the funding to work with a program that could provide that that a specialized expertise that's needed because we do, Ellen, um, address parity when we file appeals on behalf of consumers. Um, and we, we, we work when we're doing parity type appeals on behalf of consumers. Um, Pat O'Connor and myself are very much involved because they are really legal issues as opposed to some of the more just straight health arguments that are made, right? So um, we are making parity arguments for consumers when we're filing both internal and external appeals. And we are, um, if we see parity concerns, we bring them to the commissioner when it's a Maryland regulated plan. If it's a self-funded um, ERISA plan, we're bringing them to labor. If it's a non-federal government plan, we're bringing them to SOSIO. So, I mean, we are doing that work. Um, and, and admittedly, it's complicated um, and, um, and difficult. And the consumers we're helping are particularly needy. Um, and so um, having those extra resources, I would fully agree that they're needed. Um, we would, you know, it, again, we would sort of be working, I see it, I view it as, is there a way to have, you know, we're the agency that's listed on the EOBs, both under state law and under um, the ACA, right? So the Health Education Advocacy Unit is listed on those EOBs. So when consumers are denied coverage, um, we, consumers know to come to us. That's how most people get to us. And if their issue is mental health substance use, we help them like we help everyone else. So um, if we, you know, if we could um, rely on the specialized experience of a legal action center or uh, another program that specializes in that to help sort of put together those appeal packages, both at the internal and external level, that would be something that would be very beneficial. And, and that's just sort of a different, you know, sort of a different model, but that's how New York does it. So they, the appeals go through the community health advocate um, and then they reach out. And I know, and, and I've spoken with Elizabeth Benjamin who um, runs the CSS NY program. We, we are on monthly calls. Um, and so, they draft a lot of those appeals on their own, um, but I know, Ellen, that they rely on the Legal Action Center to help with some of the more complicated appeals. Um, and, 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 and of course, now have the funding to do it because of that law. So I just wanted to sort of clarify sort of how we fit in sort of into that New York model as well. Thank you, Kimberly. All right. Um... Without further ado, Van, would you like to go into the discussion of the legislation? And I can share my screen. Unmute myself. Uh, sure, I'm happy to, uh, I guess, uh, lead a discussion about the bill. Uh, you know, we, we've, you know, I think, uh, probably uh, a good place. Uh, uh, Corey has presented uh, a portion of, of the bill. 
Um, and you know, in talking about it, it might, the, the place to start uh, might be uh, with the definition of uh, consumer assistance services. And I say that because you know, that's really sort of the core of what this program and what the bill is meant, meant to provide to consumers. And so, you know, there, there are, what is it, six or seven um, uh, provisions, uh, yeah, seven uh, provisions uh, in the bill uh, as to what they do. What I suggest, uh, and unless uh, Senator uh, Augustine or somebody else uh, objects, um, is that we go through uh, each one, you know, uh, one, by, one, by, one by one and see uh, if there are concerns ab about uh, those. Does that make sense? I, I see a thumbs up and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna run with that. So uh, the, the first one, uh, and I'm not sure everyone's able to see the screen, but it's uh, consumer assistance services means one, uh, providing administrative assistance uh, to program participants, which is a defined term, to enroll in health coverage plans for which the participants qualify. And I'm just gonna throw it out there and, and ask, uh, you know, are there any concerns uh, by any of the participants with regard to that def that part portion of the definition. I see Kim up there. You're Not a concern, Kim. just a question. Um, because I read that to mean sort of a navigator function enrolling people in um, in a in um, in a plan. Um, and and yet um, the the Legal Action Center's June fourteenth letter to the commissioner indicated. The CHAP wouldn't duplicate activities such as plan enrollment functions that are currently done by the connector entities. So I'm just trying to get a, I just want to know what the plan is there. It's not something our office does because we have the na navigator entities. We certainly assist consumers if they've been um, denied the opportunity to enroll in a um, private health plan through Maryland Health Connection, or if they've been denied um, cost share reductions or APTC, and that's part of our, uh, our, our requirement under the ACA. Um, so I just wondered what, what the role it would be there um, given sort of the disconnect. Do the sponsors of the bill wanna address that or? Or I can just go on. Thank you for the comment, Kim. So, so yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, there, I think there's some others that are. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I. Oh, Senator Augustine. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't see the the or rather the understanding what maybe the Legal Action Center's letter might have said. Um, but that's uh, again the the thought process for me at least was that that this as this is the first piece, it's just that it, it would be, it's, it's that as a navigator function um, that we, we know as you get down further into the other things as they all kind of weave together, that when we're doing the outreach and the education and things like that, that it would just, it simply would make sense for this to be there. I don't know um, uh, where you were talking about, about the duplication and, and things like that. I mean, that's what I see this as, um, and the reason why, I mean, I never argued that it wasn't that others aren't doing that. Again, this is just to be additive when people are coming to here and that it would make sense for it to be there. So that was just my thought. Oh, and, and Senator, honestly, I, I actually thought when I, during the session that this per, perhaps this meant embedding with the navigator entities. So if someone reached out to a navigator entity with specialized questions about mental health or behavioral health care, that they could drill down even more on plan selection or what would be the best MC, Medicaid MCO. Like that's, mm -hmm. I was just trying to get a better idea of, because it, again, there was sort of this disconnect and um, because that I could see as beneficial to the consumer. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm sure. saying. I don't know about yeah. the disconnect that you're talking yeah. about. I'm talking about the benefit to the consumer. And that's what I, that's what I saw it as, as the... Uh, for me. Maybe. That's how I saw it too originally. That's okay. why I was asking. Yeah. yeah. That's still how I see it. <laughs> I think uh, I think Neil also raised his hand. Yes. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, absolutely nothing, no issue with the navigator function. I think it's great. I just, just for the good of the order, raising the question of whether, well, obviously uh, a duplicate of service with other uh, service providers, but is this an opportunity to fold into 
uh, providers like 211 to bolster what they already have going on. So just wanted to raise that. My understanding is that 211 doesn't actually assist with enrollment. I've never heard that that's something that 211 does or that they have a capability for that. Right now, yeah. enrollment is not something that we do. <clears throat> right. And so that was sort of the question is that something that you could do, would be interested in doing? Is that something we can add there? I don't know if that uh, was an agreement. Uh, yeah, what, what does that have to do with this bill? Yeah, I mean, this is essentially what MHBE does through the connector program. And I understand the idea that there may be some gaps that get filled in, but you know, this is what MHBE exists to do um, and its navigator and its connector program. So um, I'm not weighing in on the question of whether there is some ancillary function specific to people with mental health needs to get them connected to the right program where you might not have that embedded expertise within the existing connector system. But I think that is actually, you know, a, a, that we have a, a, a well-funded program that exists to do just that generally. And I would think Perhaps uh, you know, one way to, to work on this would be to, to say that you know the this program would would refer people to to the navigators over at the the exchange uh, you know as appropriate. Yeah, is that right? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And if I could just add one point, I mean the clear the clear piece here is, and this has been something that has been assessed in in various evaluations of consumer assistance programs. But the goal here is, is it's not to say to a consumer, here's another number for you to call in order to find to get enrolled in insurance. I'm going to actually get somebody on the line while I stay on the line so that you can talk directly to somebody who will answer your particular problem. And if it's about insurance and it's gonna to go to the navigator entity in your region, who is going to help you immediately. So it's not just giving somebody another line, another number to call, it's actually Actually doing that warm handoff and making that connection. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, is, uh, any I would, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but the other thing I don't want to leave out is that um, regardless of how much literal, you know, like staying on the line, et cetera, stuff, it, which is, can be very important, particularly for some people, is that I should be clear that the programs referred to here do not just mean insurance programs. It could be helping someone connect to Medicaid, helping someone connect to um, you know, their employer's program, you know, helping them find the program that they're qualified for. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, cover, the language is certainly broad enough uh, to env envision that for sure. So I guess your question, Dan, is would anyone object to keeping this line item one as part of this bill or suggest any edits to the language. And if we have to collect that afterwards because people need to think about it, then you know, we will make sure that there's time to do that. But I guess part of what you know, Van's goal is as he walks through these is to see which of the ones are people saying, I have an issue with this conceptually, I think it ought to be out, or I have no issue with this conceptually, but I think it needs tweaking. I think that would be very helpful as we walk through each of these. I could not have said that better myself. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> I have more sleep than you last night. All right, so while, while people are thinking about number one, uh, I'm gonna move on to number two. Uh, which uh, is assisting program participants to access treatment for mental health and substance use disorders. And I'm going to ask if anyone wants to raise their hand and, and either raise any issues or want to discuss the language in general uh, or have an objection. Make sure I go through, make sure. All right, Corey, keep looking, make sure I don't miss people, but I don't see any, um, I don't see that anyone's raised an issue with regard to that. Again, as Commissioner said, if, if, um, if you 
after the fact, think of something and you want to raise the issue, uh, please uh, go ahead and contact Corey. So uh, moving on to number three, uh, communicating and coordinating with health coverage plans on behalf of program participants and their providers regarding coverage for mental health and substance use disorder treatment under the terms of the health coverage plan in which the program participant is enrolled. Again, uh, does anyone uh, want to raise any issues, have any concerns, disagreement with the language? Uh, this is Kathy Grayson with Care First. Um, one thing that we raised in, in the context of the bill and um, is is the need for consumer data privacy um, parameters. And so, any and Kim, you know this from when you engage with with our health plans and um, on behalf of consumers. Um, one thing that's that's critical is making sure that there are adequate data protection. Um, programs and, and cybersecurity issues that I know that MIA is focused on. Um, so um, I just wanted to flag that here. I don't know that um, that this is an issue that 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 is limited to the definition here. I know there are a lot of places in the bill where um, where this this organization is, is pondered doing data analysis and data sharing with any entity it deems appropriate. So um, but I did just want to flag that um, this is one place where our team indicated um, that certainly to the extent anybody at any third party, um, whether it's a state actor or um, a non-state actor touches this data, um, there's a lot of implications there that we would wanna make sure are buttoned up um, in any final bill. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we will keep, keep that in mind, both broadly and with regard to you know, the language uh, of this. Uh, Kim? Yeah, I mean, my only comment again was, and, and I'm not sure, sort of exactly what our approach is here. But obviously we discussed earlier, there's overlapping programs that do like, so I should have said it during, assisting program participants to access treatment. I mean, that, that's a very broad statement and that could mean myriad things. And, um, and that's, that's a good service to provide. Um, similarly, communicating, coordinating with, with plans regarding coverage. I mean, yes, again, our office does that. Um, so, I mean, we may, again, have overlapping duties here, but that doesn't mean this isn't a fair definition of what consumer assistance services are. So I'm just, that's all. Okay. Anybody else? Or we'll move on down to number four. All right. Uh, thank Can you, Kim. I just one comment, Kim. I think it's really helpful for every time there's something that HEAU has within its province, even though, as you've indicated, you could use more resources and you could use more access to, you know, perhaps an external resource with particular expertise. But I think it's really helpful for you to point out the sort of what's in your umbrella already, even though it doesn't necessarily mean that it would have to be ex you exclusively, like you would, it would be nice for you to have more resources <clears throat> those things. But that's really helpful. At least I'm finding it very helpful. Uh, Commissioner, I think it's helpful. I totally agree. I think it would also be important for her to also outline the limitations of what she has at the same time. Like some of that also, I think, is an important part of it. I, I agree. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to move on to number four, uh, which is um, uh, offering uh, to connect program participants to, to federal and state governmental agencies or authorities that provide assistance to consumers in pursuing contractual or administrative appeals, grievances, or complaints against or related to health coverage plans with respect to mental health and substance use disorder benefit claims. Kim? So this is one where I might need more information. So, cause it, again, I'm seeing a disconnect. So this suggests that if someone needs to file an appeal or a grievance, um, that the, the program would connect the participants with the federal and state agencies that provide that assistance to consumers. Whereas earlier we were hearing the program would actually pursue those appeals and grievances. Um, and so, to me, that's a little bit of a disconnect. 
Well, that's the next one. That's number yeah, five, right? Yeah, you do both. Yeah. It's doing both when you get to the next one. Okay. And maybe four is their offering because maybe the participant, like in, we get complaints from people that are out of state, um, are in, like, so it might be a Marylander, but their plan is um, sightest in DC. We would still assist that Marylander because they're Marylanders. Um, but we will get people that um, might be um, someone who is California based, but their plan is in Maryland, we would assist them because they have a nexus to Maryland. Like, so if we have some sort of sort of Maryland nexus. Um, otherwise, if there's no nexus, then we would, of course, send them to the right place. Um, so, yeah, I just it, it was a one suggests that they would connect it to others and one suggests that they would do it. And, and to me, it was just a disconnect. And I was just trying to understand. I just, I just, I'll just respond. I think it actually it just provides an understanding that every case that comes is different and that the individual may require um, different, may have different needs. It may be a need of a connection or it might be like we're gonna talk about here on, on uh, the, another one, but that the idea is that these folks be equipped to be able to get them to the right place from one centralized location. Yeah, from, from a bill drafting standpoint, I don't, you know, there's some overlap between four and five, but you know, that does, that's not, that doesn't make it, you know, legally infirm or anything like that. But um, I'm gonna go ahead with Neil. Sorry to uh, backtrack a little bit. I was just thinking a little bit more about number three and what, what Kim had said about duplicating some of the work that HEAU is doing. I was just curious, um, in the event that a, a program participant, let's say reaches out to both HEAU and CHAP, how do we ensure from like a practical consideration that you know we don't create confusion with the plans or among the consumer or with, with CHAP and HEAU and everyone else involved? How do we, how do we make sure we're just going to one, one place? Maybe that's not a definitional thing. I'm just curious. If I could, if I could sort of talk a little practically about how this works. I mean, part of the issue is, is, is we've all said there are many avenues for people to get assistance. If somebody gets a denial of benefits and they see HEAU's name on, and they on that denial and they contact HEAU, then HEAU is going to, I'm sure, provide the assistance for that individual. If for some re if an individual is coming through some of the other um, avenues in which CHAP offers services, because again, it's, it's from the point in which we're perhaps helping somebody identify a provider. If they're having problems finding a network provider, if they have a right to go to an out network provider, CHAP would be assisting that person at that point, and then they could continue on through that client assistance, client representation. And so because, you know, I, I again, uh, partly this ability to offer services, CHAP could basically say, you know, there's another entity out there called the Health Education and Advocacy Unit. You can get assistance from them. We can provide you assistance. And it then is that individual's choice. They make the decision. But if somebody is working with somebody from CHAP from the beginning on, it's high likelihood that they would stick with that entity with CHAP because they developed a trusting relationship and they're engaged in the work. I just don't think there's gonna be a lot of duplication of effort, obviously. That's the last thing any entity wants to do. And you ask ahead of time, are you working with anybody else in order to resolve this problem? That is a, a common first question that, that arises whenever you begin any kind of client assistance. Kim? And, and Ellen, I actually Ellen. saw it. I actually saw it a different way. I saw it as um, if there's a if there's a, a state funded chat program that specializes in mental health and substance use disorder. I saw it as an opportunity for us to say to consumers that came to us through um, the traditional means um, to um, you know warm hand them off um, or use chat as that resource, much like the um, the New York model. So. Um, I saw it as an opportunity to have that that specialized expertise 
um, I agree. as opposed I agree, to Kim. us having silos. No, I, I agree. That's what I thought. That's how I envision it as well. I mean, again, so what you all do is obviously more broad. It is, you know, it, it's more all encompassing. Whereas this really is meant to be more focused with people, with the folks and the navigators who are dealing specifically with behavioral health concerns versus more broadly speaking, what you all do, which of course covers the whole gamut. I, I just agree with you on that. I think I'll go to Delica Colson. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Van. Um, so this actually is a question for Kim. So in, in your vision here, um, as you just expressed it, if a, a question or an issue come, would come to HEAU around uh, mental health or substance use disorder, you would, if this um, entity exists, you would automatically just hand off the person to the entity. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we would have to have, we use a, you know, we have a, a, a medical, a release for our medical information form that we've worked closely with um, the state carriers, some federal carriers with our largest hospital systems and provider systems, right? So we've developed a, an authorization form. Obviously, that, that would need to be changed. Um, or we would maybe have an MOU. I could see us potentially having an MOU. I mean, we, we you know, there's, there's a lot of things that would have to be worked out. Um, so that would allow us to, like right now, our, um, our authorization is written in a way that consumers that reach out to us for assistance, of course, we need to get their medical records and insurance records. So we get the authorization to do that. And our authorization includes information that in, in so sharing with us, we can share with the Maryland Insurance Administration um, and with other state and federal agencies. Well, this wouldn't be a setup necessarily a state agency. So there's that issue. Can we share it sort of with an outside entity under our current authorization? And what would that have to look like? I and mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, things we have to really think through about sharing information. Um, and again, you know, if the consumer would want us to 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 hand them off to a specialized entity, I can't imagine why they wouldn't, but you know, we, one never knows. Um, so there would be, there, there'd be a lot of moving parts. So, so I mean, but in a, in a nutshell, it wouldn't actually reduce your workload that much, or would it? Um, well, it would to the extent that we have, um, I mean, we get about, I'm trying to think, maybe 11 or 12 mental health substance use disorder cases a year. So we don't get a lot of those cases. Um, and, you know, to the extent that there's more outreach and education, those numbers could increase um, as more people have access to mental health treatment than ever before, right? We're suddenly funding this treatment, more people um, will be denied services, we know, coverage of services. So, I mean, I could see an increase, but so to the extent that we could take those 11 cases or 12 cases or potentially more, they are, as Ellen pointed out, super complicated cases. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it would certainly decrease sort and, 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 and delegate. We also, uh, in, as, as the Senator asked us to do, we don't handle Medicaid cases. So we, you know, those get, we just refer those back to the Medicaid program. Um, so there, there's a hold there. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Kathy. Thanks, Van. Um, just wanted to flag there, um, and so it, Kim, you sort of alluded to this, if, if there would be some sort of warm handoff or um, referral to a third party, um, am I correct to assume that, that we would want to make sure that that third party had the same data cyber privacy standards of the state or any other actor that would manage an individual's PHI? I see Kim nodding. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to be sensitive to that again as we work to implement uh, someone's cybersecurity legislation from last year. <laughs> just kidding. But, uh, but of course, it's got to be top of mind um, as well. So just wanted to flag that. I, I think we all want to, I, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say, say that I think that with regard to uh, consumer data, no one here is uh, in a position where they want that consumer data to be getting the wrong, into the wrong hands. And, I, yeah. um, 
right. it just it gets you know a lot of these community partners are you know low budget nonprofits <clears throat> and they're doing phenomenal work but they can't necessarily stand up the type of security protection programs that um, that are expected of us as a regulated entity so that was the only reason I flag it and I'm absolutely not questioning the um, the merits or the intent of these organizations um, but when we go third party um, you know when, and, and we saw this it, it, when I was at the insurance administration, even all payers aren't as sophisticated. Um, your small mom and pop, you know, insurance agency, for example, versus a care first is not going to have the same type of technology investment. So right. um, I, I think we got to be really um, just aware and, and, and look into the, the, the breadth and depth of, of um, information there. Uh, thank you, Kathy. You know, um, one of the things that I've asked for from the CHAMP program in New York uh, is to see some of the agreements uh, that that they have uh, with their uh, with their partners, uh, because I think that would be uh, very helpful in terms of trying to understand stand the you know what the scope of what they think the services are and and you know what what protections they're requiring their partners uh, to have in place. Um, so um, we're tr uh, we're in the process of trying to get get that information. Um, we we don't have it yet. All right, I'm going to move on to uh, number five, which I suspect uh, might generate some uh, conversation. Uh, it's uh, assisting program participants to pursue contractual, administrative, or judicial complaints against health coverage plans for failure to provide mental health or substance use disorder benefits required by contract or under federal or state law, including providing legal representation. Uh, Ellen has certainly talked about uh, what, what um, Legal Action Center has been doing for New York, and that's been very helpful. My question is, uh, does anybody have any concerns uh, with regard to the scope of the proposed services as listed in number five? And this would include litigation because, you know, in, in that drafting of the word pursue, it doesn't, it doesn't limit, it, it includes, you know, whatever is needed to enforce those rights. Actually, I do have a question for Ellen um, that this might be helpful, I think, uh, to know. With regard to you know, pursuing a uh, litigation like of that nature um, at, you know, through a complaint process, what what's the expected cost for some for that type of uh, litigation? Uh, noting that you know the, the budget for this is pretty limited. Um, uh, thanks, thanks, Van. I, um, I I don't have a response for that. I mean, I we don't obviously we um, uh, that's not been a part yet of, of the work Legal Action Center has done. And I and as I said, I don't believe that. Uh, Champ under Consumer Services Society has has filed litigation. So again, those are all considerations. And and again, in providing legal guidance and legal representation, that has to be taken into consideration. And um, very often there will be efforts to connect an individual with another law firm that has that capacity. Often firms do those kind that kind of representation on a pro bono basis. So yet again, that can be um, a, a a path that chap would go down right For, you know uh, giving a warm hand to a to a, a, um, a firm that's willing to do pro bono work is one thing uh having the state pay for the litigation uh which this seems to envision obviously uh, um, is a different issue all right i'll move on uh, hey corey can you thank you scrolling up to number six uh, providing outreach and education to program participants and consumers regarding access to mental health and substance use disorder treatment services under health coverage plans. Opening the floor. I'm not seeing any hands. Well, Van, mm -hmm. I'll just say very quickly, that's something that CEAU does every day, all day. Um, obviously, there's more that we could do, and we're looking to expand our outreach programs and educational programs and materials, but um, 
that is definitely something that we're dedicated to do. Well, and if Corey would scroll up just a little bit, we could see the whole sentence because it keep going, Corey, just a little bit more. And you can see where it says, other than consumer education information provided under 2-303.1, which is your group. So that would be you coordinating Joy um, you know, with this program so that you, it wouldn't duplicate what you're already doing. Okay, uh, seeing no uh, comments, uh, I'm gonna, I guess, uh, close the conversation um, with regard to that particular provision. Now, uh, I noticed that it's, uh, according to my watch, uh, 1216. I know we wanted to leave some time uh, for those, you know, uh, other stakeholders who are on the call. I don't know if now's a good time or the other uh, thought I had would, we could go further into the bill and, and perhaps discuss you know the structure of the bill. Uh, you know, um, you know where where this uh, chat program is housed uh, and things of that nature. But um, I want to see how what people think about whether we should do that now. I suspect that's going to be more than a fifteen minute conversation. Van, I just would just say I, I felt like this was you know thank you for us going through this portion of it. And I definitely like the way that you sort of walk through it. And perhaps it is a subsequent one where there is more time for it. And that there probably are some things that people may want to share if 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 you're okay with that. Yeah, it makes Thank, I think that makes sense, especially in light of uh, today's conversation uh, in general. I think uh, it's been very informative, uh, in, in my, to, at least it has been to me. And uh, you know, so I think, you know, people, might want to reflect on that after, um, uh, and we can talk about it next session. Um, Delegate Collison. Uh, thank you, Van. Um, and I'm actually going to have to jump off. So I was hoping that you would decide. I mean, I'm not going to you know, uh, abend the agenda, but I was hoping that you would decide to um, carry the, the next part on to the next meeting. But I would ask, uh, just for clarification, um, that there would still be the opportunity to reflect on what we did today and that could potentially in the next meeting we could come back with some you know modifications of this part um, at the next meeting thank you i yes i certainly didn't mean to close the conversation on that okay uh, and, and you know as the commissioner uh, Bahrain had said uh, if anybody wants to uh, submit uh, written comments uh, with regard to any of these provisions that, that we've just gone over, uh, you know, we can provide them uh, to, the, to the panel uh, and then, you know, provide further discussion about it. it I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we certainly don't want to, well, personally, I don't want to, uh, uh, we, we, we would hate losing uh, your, the benefit of your um, input uh, with regard to uh, further discussions about uh, this particular bill. So, uh, what I think might make sense to do right now is to, to open the floor uh, to, to others who have not had an opportunity uh, to uh, discuss what uh, we've talked about. Um, I, I think that's, is that Craig who, who can do that, uh, Kathleen? Yeah, I was, I was going to say maybe um, at this point we can take down the, um, the, the bill so that yeah. I could see, you know, folks, but, um, you know, Corey, this is, this is your next agenda item. All right. Um, do the attendees. Uh, Laura Mitchell. I will move her over now. I think she just needs to unmute. Laura's already actually in the it, working group. No, I wasn't. I was outside and it was transferring me, so I couldn't okay. do anything for a minute. So sorry for the delay. Um, yeah, I'm Laura Mitchell from Montgomery County, very involved with the MCCPTA, and I chair the Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Advisory Council for the county. Um, I, I heard all of this discussion 
And I just want to center the consumer experience of which I've had a lot <laughs> over the years and what happens and talk about duplication of services, um, talk about you know who's doing what or where it's happening. In my view, what we've experienced in the last decade or two, we can't have enough people doing this work. We can't have too many people in the field of helping consumers connect to insurance and get the services that they need. We lost almost 2,600 uh, Marylanders last year just to overdose. That doesn't include the death by suicide. Um, and most of them, I've been really steeped in this for 20 years now. Um, I've stood next to a lot of parents bearing their kids because they couldn't get to care. And that's unacceptable. So whatever uh, duplication we have, or whatever uh, coordination we need to align uh, to, to set up must happen because this can't continue. And it's, we're seeing it in our schools now from January to June of, last, of this year, we lost about a student a week in Montgomery County alone to one of the two of those. That's unacceptable. So, and most of the parents I talk to don't know where to turn. You know, I, I get calls all the time. I have my, my, my signature line in my email is very long because I list all of that. So when someone has a problem, they can call me or email me or reach out um, just so they know some contact point that can help navigate that. And as much experience as I have, I don't, I can't find services much of the time. So there can't be too much in my opinion. I just wanted to share that from the consumer perspective. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for uh, the work that you do. Um, David Stewart. Mr. Stewart, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm just, it's just a little slow transferring. I, I want to just say ditto to everything that was just said. As a program director for a connector entity program in Maryland, uh, we I run the Navigator program for Allegheny Garrett and Washington counties, and I'll just say this is an additive. <laughs> this is not competitive in any way. I look at what's in that language of the legislation, and I see some needed freedom, right? And I don't see that there's anything wrong with Maryland doing things a little different. And I can tell you that my navigators need help specifically with these issues. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I everybody here does really good work. I interact with all of these agencies all the time. I'm emailing with MIA today. Um, my point is exactly what the woman just said. There just simply isn't enough. And I don't see anything in this bill that steps on anybody's toes. Um, and I think having a little extra freedom and some of that looseness is a really good thing because we don't know what we don't know. And I can tell you, if you meet one consumer, you've met one consumer. The circumstances that you're helping somebody with can change. You just can't make any assumptions. Every person you see is different. And I can tell you that I have run up the ladder with consumers that ran into the fact that, oh, their insurance company is outside of Maryland. Maryland's got borders all around and we're thin. And so, so many people I help, they don't, they're not even with the Maryland Health Connection, right? So I know the limits of all these different resources and I run into them regularly. Um, there's definitely a need for somebody else in this space to work cooper cooperatively with everybody else. And from my position, running a program, I welcome it. All right, thank you, David. Um, Courtney Bergen. Hi. Um... So I just, I really want to echo what everyone has said, um, what both David and Laura just said. Um, and I just want to personally say I've had, you know, multiple different insurance carriers since I've lived in Maryland, including Medicare, Medicaid, 
private insurance regulated by the state of Maryland, private insurance that's in a ERISA regulation. <laughs> and HEAU was a huge help to me when I had my um, state regulated plan and you know, really did great work and I really appreciated it. But since I've now been on uh, ERISA regulated plan, Medicare and Medicaid, I've been stuck and I, I can tell you, like I have spent hours on the phone contacting Medicare for assistance, contacting Medicaid for assistance, contacting Medicare Rights Center, all of these different entities, but because there's nothing in the state of Maryland that can serve all of those needs and the, that coordinated, coordination of care issues, I've gotten stuck and I've gotten even kicked out of treatment programs because of no one being available to help me resolve those problems quickly in like a one-stop shop where I know how to go. And so I just want to say, like, I think that can be a really deadly issue for people to run into, especially people on Medicare and Medicaid who are probably some of the most vulnerable when you're talking about mental health and substance use disorder issues. And that's why I think this um, chat program could be really beneficial and life-changing for people. Thank you, Courtney. Um, anyone else? Uh, Senator Augustine, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Yeah, actually, I'm just, I, I do. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was, actually struck um, by Kim's comment that they have 11 or 12 cases a year that they, that, you know, that they're working on with this. And I mean, that really, I think it's important for us to let that kind of sink in given the scope that we know of this, um, of this entire situation. I just think that's something that was very important to me. And I would be, I, I just also just am interested of course in the information similarly with MIA, um, because we know, as I've shared with this group before, um, you know that the that there are certain barriers uh, to folks actually finding, getting there, and that's really what this is—a very, very, very focused, very, very much for behavioral health. And and so I just that really did strike me, given you know, particularly if I look at even though New York is three times the size of us, they were. Um, you know, the, the program is seen uh, 4,000 in the four years is to say that's 1,000 people. I mean, it's exponentially more people getting help. Um, and so I just feel like that's just something that's important. So thank you so much for this. This is a great conversation. Thank you so much, Van. Look forward to it continuing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Augustine. Uh, Kim? Yeah, and I and I don't I don't know this number, Senator, but I'd be curious to know from the Medicaid program, like the numbers of um, behavioral health, mental health, substance use disorder denials. Um, I agree. That's a number we should have. I agree with you. Because I yeah. Yep. Because that's a, yeah. It's another poll, like you were talking about. That's, I totally agree. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, I'm counting the cases that we mediate. When I say 11, I'm talking about complaints that we mediate for consumers. Mediate meaning handle the appeal. Um, mm -hmm. And again, because we are not doing the Medicaid piece. Yep. Um, I, mm -hmm. and when I spoke to New York, um, they recently started putting information about the program on Medicaid denials. And I think they're a little overwhelmed by that. And I think Connecticut was trying to do the same thing. Um, so I'd be curious to know those numbers. Agreed. All right, thank you. Um, Ellen, quickly before we adjourn. Only to say there has been some recent data that was that was issued, and I'll be happy to share this with the with the full uh, work group or with you, Corey, so that you could share it if you're interested. Um, the Department of Health issued a, a massive report evaluating the sort of parity violations that existed in New York. They had both private insurance data and Medicaid data. I think it's really very uh, informative for, for all of us. So I'll be happy to share that report with you. All right, thank you, Alan. And any issues with the definitions that we went over um, earlier this meeting, please email me. Um, please do it by the 20th. Our next meeting is September 
um, 30th at 1130. I will send out a reminder and email to everyone. So thank you all for the discussion and joining today. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.